right. Well, we have a good group here. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with Brian, um, and I'll give you a little background of uh, kind of the format for the day. Um, but yeah, thank you all for being here today. Um, just to note, this is held in joint collaboration with the Center for Cognitive Science, the Honors College, and, and CWIT. So we really um, you know, thank all the collaborative partners. Um, ultimately, our one of our goals is really to bridge together the arts and these and sciences to have a lively dialogue. And so that's what it means to all of us. So this is kind of one topic um, that touches upon that, so the idea of um, talking about the social and ethical implications of artificial intelligence, robotics, really hot topic right now, um, engages multiple departments, which is something the Center for Cognitive Sciences is really striving for to bring us all together as a community. Um, so each faculty member, the format, um, each faculty member panelist is going to talk for about 20 minutes about an area or topic within this bigger umbrella. Um, and then what we'll do is we will open the floor for dialogue. And then afterwards, there's a reception, so there's food. Um, and yeah, so so uh, thanks so much for, for joining. And first, we'll start by, start by introducing Dr. Brian McLaughlin. He is a distinguished professor in philosophy and the director of the Center for Cognitive Science. Thank you, Sarah. And I'd like to thank you, Honors College. And I'd like to thank the Honors College for um, sponsoring this. I'm very honored to be here with my two distinguished co symposiums As you'll see, our talks will be very different, but we'll all be uh, talking about something that falls under the general umbrella of ethical and social issues. I'm just going to read. That way I'll stay in control of time, so you can just kind of read along with me on the screen. Can everybody hear me on my mm -hmm. Okay. In 1999, in Seattle, Washington, the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Robots was formed. A central tenet of the ASPCR is that sentient robots would have unalienable rights. The Society acknowledges that there are no sentient robots on the planet, but claims that given the pace of technological advances, they are much closer than previously thought. All of these quotes are taken from the Society's website. The mission of the Society is to ensure the rights of all artificially created sentient beings. The Society's plan is to outline a robotic bill of rights and eventually establish a lobbying board to further those rights on the body politic. A sentient robot would indeed have inalienable rights. It would have moral rights. Sentience confers a kind of moral status. Sentient beings are moral patients. Their sentience is a moral consideration in any interaction with them. To take an obvious and pertinent example, if a robot could feel pain or suffer in some way, it would deserve humane treatment. A being can be a moral patient without being a moral agent. Dogs, for instance, are moral patients, but not moral agents since they lack the kinds of mental abilities required to be moral agents. At present, only normal humans past a certain age of mental development are moral agents. If, however, a robot were to have the kind of mental abilities in question, then it would be a moral agent. It would have moral duties and obligations and could be held morally accountable. It would be a member of the moral community subject to moral censure and praise. A robot would be a machine, but arguably we are biochemical machines. A robot would also be an artifact. We're not artifacts. But suppose that sometime in the future, a wet lab constructed physical duplicates of a human egg and a human sperm from basic molecules, had the sperm fertilize the egg, put the fertilized egg in a machine that functioned just like a woman's womb so that it develops in the normal manner. And then after nine months, it was given to a human family and raised as a human child. The result would be a being with the mental abilities of a normal human being, even though the being would be an artifact. What matters to whether a being is a moral agent or a patient is just what, if any, mental abilities the being has. This can be expressed as follows. There can be no difference with respect to general status as a moral agent or moral patient without a difference in mental abilities. Thus, if two beings have exactly the same mental abilities, then one will be a moral agent 
or patient, if and only if the other is. The kinds of robots that I'll be exclusively concerned with are silicon-based, formed from the silicon of the Earth's hard rock crust, rather than the carbon of the Earth's soil. And so robots that are very different in material composition and structure from any known living being. But that would be relevant to moral status only if it matters to mental abilities. The key issue is whether a robot has mental abilities. Other factors matter only insofar as they matter to mental abilities. Moral status is conferred by mental abilities alone. And moral status matters. That's why it matters deeply whether a robot has mental abilities. The ASPCR likens itself to the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the ASPCA. In 1823, the philosophy of mind and ethics began to join hands in support of the moral rights of animals when Jeremy Bentham made his now famous remark. The question is not can they reason, nor can they think, but can they suffer? The idea that sentient beings are moral patients eventually started to spread and in 1866, in New York City, the ASPCA was formed. The ASPCR was established in 1999. So the question is, has the time come to join the cause of the ASPCR? When the ASPCA was formed, there was, as there is today, many suffering animals. There are currently no sentient robots, and so no robots that even have the capacity to suffer. Still, if a robot were sentient, it would have moral rights. Of course, it's also true that if, as, pan, as pan-experientialists might claim, pan-experientialists think that every, literally everything is sentient, gelatin is sentient, then it too would have moral rights. Indeed, if a witch cast a spell that made a broomstick sentient, then the broomstick would have moral rights. Contra pan-experientialism, gelatin doesn't have mental abilities, and no one can cast a spell that makes a broomstick sentient. But whether a robot could be sentient, whether it's possible for a robot to be sentient, is quite another matter. The ASPCR maintains not only that it's possible for there to be a robot that's sentient, but also that the pace of research in artificial intelligence, AI, is such that we should expect sentient robots soon. If the society is right about that, its mission is urgent. How urgent will depend on how soon we should expect them. It was reported in the New York Times, November 17, 2003, that Hans Moravec, a roboticist at Carnegie Mellon University, stated, I'm confident we can build robots with behavior that is just as rich as human being behavior. You can quiz it as much as you like about its internal mental life, and it would answer as any human being. In his 2003 Encyclopedia Britannica online article, Robots, he stated that if the current pace of robotic development continues, robots are likely to parallel the evolution of vertebrate intelligence to the human level and probably beyond within 50 years. In his 2009 Scientific American article, he predicted that robot intelligence would surpass our own before 2050. If his prediction is correct, there will be robots with human level intelligence or greater within 32 years. Although there's certainly no consensus in the AI community about when such robots should be expected, or indeed even a dominant view, it's nevertheless fair to say that such predictions are at least not uncommon among roboticists. I could provide many, many more examples. If the 2050 prediction can be trusted, or even if, say, a 2118 prediction or a 2150 prediction is accurate, then the urgency of the ASPCR's objective can't be exaggerated, especially given the global pace at which countries deal with looming crises. Think of the response to global warming. We should begin to act now. Indeed, the robotics industry should now be put on notice that if it develops robots with intelligence even approaching human level intelligence, it will not own them and will never be permitted to sell them. 
the sale and ownership of beings with intelligence, even approaching human level intelligence, would be slavery. But to echo Ebenezer's question to the most fearsome of the three ghosts, are these shadows of things that will be, or are they shadows of things that may be only? I stand in staunch opposition to the sale of robots that have intelligence that even approaches human level intelligence. I do so on the grounds that it would be slavery. Moreover, there's no question that sentient robots, whatever their level of intelligence, would have moral rights and thus deserve legal protection. I see, however, no urgency in carrying out the ASPCR's mission. I don't think the United Nations should be mobilized. I feel no need to contact my congressperson or to alert the press. I don't even feel that I should join the ASPCR. The reason is that, from what I've been able to gather, I don't share the ASPCR's assessment of the future of technology. If I did, I'd join. But I don't now see either sentient robots or robots with intelligence approaching human level intelligence on the horizon. Perhaps technology could soon develop to the point where a cloud-connected humanoid robot with the information storage capacity and information processing powers of IBM's Watson, enhanced with facial recognition abilities, and made to look, sound, and move just like, say, Lieutenant Commander Data of Star Trek, could stand behind a podium with former Jeopardy! champions and win the Grand Championship. But despite its outward human-like appearance, such a humanoid robot would no more have moral status than does Watson. It would be neither a moral agent nor a moral patient, since, like Watson, it would be devoid of mentality. The word artificial and artificial intelligence may be taken in two ways. It may be understood in its sense in artificial flower. An artificial flower is not a flower, it only resembles the flower in superficial ways. Or by artificial intelligence may be meant an artifact that is also intelligent, genuinely intelligent. That's the holy grail of AI. But currently, at least, we have artificial intelligence only in the former sense. Words matter, and mental words are no exception. If mental words are being used in some proprietary AI senses, not to be confused with the senses of those terms in ordinary English. So that, for instance, having human level intelligence in the AI sense doesn't confer moral status, then that should be made very explicit indeed. Otherwise, it will inspire well-meaning groups such as the ASPCR. If such AI mental talk is intended as liberal, then those so talking should keep in mind that such prognostications are a double-edged sword. They might entice financial support, but the edge that cuts against AI research and do so in two ways. Promises can create expectations that won't be met, and there are promises no one should be allowed to keep. I use both mental terms and moral terms literally. The point I'm underscoring is that the issue of robot mentality is inseparable from the issue of robot rights rights that should be legally protected. There is, to be sure, a tsunami of robots on the way. It will bring a flood of pressing moral and social issues in its wake. Indeed, the issues will soon be so pressing that a massive education program about the coming robots is urgently needed. I hope that's one of the things this panel has uh, provided. Just to name a few of the issues, they will include job displacement, how to program a self-driving car, the use of robots in war and in law enforcement, and such matters as, for instance, whether there should be legal protection against someone, think of an acquaintance or co-worker or ex-spouse, being able to order and purchase a humanoid sex bot with your exact likeness and voice, as well as an enormous number of other matters, including ones we're not now anticipating. Although these are truly pressing moral and social issues, robot rights is not among them. The issues concern the effects of the robots in question on us, not our effects on them. They can be damaged or destroyed, but neither harm nor wrong, since they will be devoid of mentality. No doubt members of the ASPCR will not feel reassured by my claims. No doubt some will think that I'm misinformed naive, or simply ignorant. 
should cold water be thrown in my face to wake me from my dogmatic slumber? Am I naive or ignorant in thinking that there will be no sentient or human level intelligent robots, at least for the foreseeable future? I won't be able to answer that question tonight, but I'll have some things to say in defense of my position. To begin, it's very important to distinguish intelligence and sentience. To turn a phrase of Forrest Gump's mother, we might say that intelligence is as intelligence does. To fix our ideas, we could take human level intelligence to, the be, to be the ability to be a fluent speaker of a natural language, like English, German, or Japanese. This notion of human level intelligence is pertinent to our concerns, since the manufacture and sale of robots that are fluent speakers of a natural language would be slaving. I think that with enough time, effort, and money, genuinely intelligent robots will be in our future. But robots with human level intelligence in this sense is another far more controversial matter. Robots with human level intelligence in this sense may be possible, but they are not now on the horizon. Even if we'll someday be able to construct such robots, we already believe a long way from that day. If, however, I'm wrong about that, if they'll soon be here, please let me know. I'll join the ASPCR. But intelligence is one thing, sentience another. It's one issue whether a robot made of silicon and, say, steel could be genuinely intelligent. It's another whether such a robot could be sentient. It's one question whether a robot made of silicon and steel could reason. It's another whether it could feel. I'll now focus just on sentience, setting the issue of intelligence aside. Material composition and structure could matter to sentience in a way that it doesn't matter to intelligence, since intelligence just is what intelligence does. A being is sentient just in case it's like something to be that being. Material objects experience acceleration and the like, but sentient beings have subjective experiences, experiences that are like something for them as subjects. A being is sentient just in case the being is able to have subjective experiences. It's sentience in this sense that confers moral rights. The question and issue is thus whether it's possible for a silicon-based robot to have subjective experiences. Let's first ask what kind of possibility is in question. A silicon-based sentient robot is, I believe, coherently conceivable and so conceptually possible. There's no contradiction inherent in the idea of such a robot. The idea isn't like, say, the idea of a round square. I'll be concerned, however, with nomological possibility. Nomos is the Greek word for law. Nomological possibility is possibility given the laws of nature. The issue is thus whether Mother Nature's laws permit a silicon-based robot with subjective experiences. To be sure, there's also the important issue of technological possibility. But let it suffice to note that if such a robot is nomologically impossible, it will be forever technologically impossible, even for the most intelligent beings in the universe, whoever those beings are. Whatever is nomologically impossible is ipso facto technologically impossible. We can't build what Mother Nature prohibits us from building. We don't now know the answer to the question whether a silicon-based robot with subjective experiences is nomologically possible. Such a robot may be like a machine that transfers information faster than the speed of light, something we can easily imagine, but that Mother Nature's laws do not permit. But then again, it may not be like that. No one knows for sure. But why then do some AI researchers think such robots are not only nomologically possible, but may soon be technologically possible. I suspect there's a behaviorist assumption lurking in the background. The behavior in question involves outward or overt movements of the body, movements of the periphery of the body, so-called peripheral behavior, rather than behavior of systems of neurons. 
Consider the following thesis endorsed by the philosopher Daniel Dennett. Nomological behaviorism. It's nomologically necessary that, ensured by the laws of nature that, if two beings are exactly behaviorally alike, exactly alike in their actual behavior and in how they are disposed to behave, then they are exactly alike with respect to sentience. I suspect that an assumption like nomological behaviorism lies behind views such as those expressed by Morabe. We call this claim, I'm confident we can build robots with behavior that is just as rich as human being behavior. Whether or not I'm right in my suspicion, I should note that, for reasons I'll state shortly, I myself think that if nomological behaviorism is true, then there may well be sentient robots in the near future. I also think, however, that nomological behaviorism is false, and so I'm not ready to join the ASPCR. Nomological behaviorism is a general thesis. All it takes to show that it's false is a single counterexample. Such an example would have to be a case of two beings that are behaviorally exactly alike, yet differ with respect to sentience. The case would not have to be an actual case, but it would have to be a case that is at least permitted by the laws of nature. A normal adult human being is, of course, sentient. It's also true that a normal adult human being will speak a natural language. A behavioral duplicate of a normal adult human being would have to have the same verbal dispositions as that human. It's my understanding that no one today has even a clue about how to construct a robot with the same dispositions to verbal behavior as, an normal, as a normal adult human being. But I don't see that as relevant to the issue of robot sentience. It would be truly foolish indeed for a roboticist trying to be the very first to build a sentient robot to try to do so by building a robot that's a behavioral duplicate of a normal adult human being. Sentience certainly doesn't require the ability to speak the natural language. Deaf adults who've never learned to sign, pre-verbal infants, and very many kinds of nonverbal animals are sentient. Consider then a normal human neonate, a baby of less than four weeks old. Neonates are sentient. They can, for instance, feel pain, and that suffices for sentience. Building a silicon-based robot that is behaviorally exactly like a human neonate is not something that anyone can now do. But it doesn't seem so terribly far out of reach, given the present state of technological know-how. Consider also a sentient mammal that is hardly among the most intelligent non-human animals on the planet, and that is not especially behaviorally active, namely a three-toed sloth. No one now knows how to build a silicon-based robot that is behaviorally exactly like a normal sloth. But this too doesn't seem so very far out of reach. I think that if a well-staffed, well-funded research team focused on the project, it may well be able to produce neonate robots with the behavioral dispositions of normal neonates, or sloth robots with the behavioral dispositions of normal sloths by 2050. For that reason, I think that if nomological behaviorism is true, then there could very well be sentient robots by 2050. If nomological behaviorism is true, then such a neonate robot would have the same moral status as a neonate since it would have the same mental abilities as a neonate. And such a sloth robot would have the same moral status as a sloth, since it would have the same mental abilities as a sloth. They would, respectively, have the same moral rights, and so deserve equal protection under the law. If, however, either such a neonate robot or such a neonate sloth would not be sentient, then nomological behaviorism is Neonates and sloths feel pain, for instance, and hunger. Would the silicon-based neonate robots or the silicon-based sloth robots feel pain and hunger? If you think the answer is no, then you're thereby committed to rejecting nomological behaviorism. If you think the answer is yes, then ask yourself, has the time come to join the cause of the ASPCR? As I noted, I think nomological behaviorism is false. I take these hypothetical cases to be counterexamples. 
I think it's a mistake to think that material composition and structure matter to sentience only insofar as they matter to dispositions to the pain. I think such robots would be could be neither harmed nor wrong, since they would be devoid of mental abilities. I thus see nothing morally objectionable per se with such robots being manufactured and sold, or the owner shutting one off and storing it for years and then having it, or taking one apart and selling the parts. In 2010, there was a joint meeting of the Engineering and Physical Research Council and the Arts and Humanities Research Council. They issued a series of statements that include robots are multi-use tools. Humans, not robots, are responsible agents. And robots are manufactured artifacts. The illusion of emotions and intent should not be used to exploit vulnerable users. I endorse these statements and would add that the ethical issues that will arise concerning human-robot interactions will concern their effects on us not our effects on them, since they would be devoid of mentality. If, however, we were someday to develop sentient robots that act with intent, then we would have to face the issue of robot wants. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. We were here yesterday from Vancouver. Uh, very beautiful campus that you have. Uh, so I'm going to give my perspective as a roboticist. I've been working on robots for about 10 years in Japan and France, including work on um, robots that interact with people. Um, and it'll be interesting when we talk about all these issues together on this panel later on. So I'll give you my view on this. So the reason why I'm in robotics now is because I want to build robots kind of like... from Tadashi Industries, these Baymax, a huge bounce forward in compassionate technology programmed with over 10,000 medical procedures and a tender-hearted attitude that comes as standard. Baymax is the new height in advanced design and engineering. But beyond this, you'll love the true friend that Baymax will become. Warning, in laboratory conditions, some hugs have proven to be addictive. Consult your doctor. Baymax, your personal healthcare companion. Has anybody seen this movie? This doesn't even be Baymax. Okay. So this is kind of my goal in life, if you will, to build a robot that is um, useful, so it can help you out and check your health and so forth, but also be a kind commanding, kind of like C-3PO. Um, here's what I worked on in Japan that is starting to get towards this. So let's see if this works. Some other awesome uses of AI, for example, in the medical industry. 
um, this is some of the work that we're doing in our lab, trying to have robots. You can't see the robot, it's just that camera on a stick, but where you can point and say, please go over here. And the goal is to have the robot go over there and perhaps pick up something that you can't because maybe you're um, in a wheelchair or unable to bend over because your back's not good. So hopefully have a robot that could do that for you. But, so here was a survey that came out in Canada last week. Uh, it says here, um, at least in, in Canada, only 38% of people believe AI will contribute positively to the Canadian economy. I find that that's actually quite a low number. 25% of Canadians trust AI companies what to do, to, that they will do something that's right for Canada. Whew, like, who would, we have a big trust issue in AI, and I think that's why we have this um, panel tonight, is because there's this um, mistrust about what the AI is, what it's going to do for us, is it going to impact jobs, um, you know, all, all of these types of things. So, one suggestion that they had is, well, maybe it's kind of a new thing, and building trust will require um, some efforts to, to educate um, everyone about what good it will actually do for us, not just make jobs. So, um, AI is a huge field. Let's just talk about what I know. <laughs> Robots. Um, one of the questions that I tried to answer in my previous research was about empathy. So, I work for a lab named the Rosie Lab. Rosie stands for Robots with Social Intelligence and Empathy. Um, and that's a big question. So do we want robots to be empathetic? Well, here's the thing. Um, Sherry Turkle, she is, uh, she's working at MIT, so she's a professor there. She's written a, a great book called Alone Together, Why We Expect More from Technology and Less from Each Other. It's quite a, whew, a scathing review of the technology that we build today, making, um, to saying that we're, it's actually pulling us apart rather than bringing us together. And one of the things that she says is, we shouldn't be building technology that will fake empathy. We had this thing about, you know, you shouldn't show emotions you don't really feel. This is something that we find um, is kind of deceptive and, and maybe mis makes for mistrust. And so the question is, okay, if a robot acts empathetic but doesn't feel actual empathy, that's, that's wrong, right? So this is one of the questions that we grapple with in robotics. Do we want to make these compassionate technologies that don't actually feel it? So that's one of the questions that is up for discussion. Um, my personal view on that is you have a lot of people working in um, industries such as, let's say, an airline um, airline flight attendant. They have to be on all the time. They have to be pleasant all the time. But they're probably not always feeling what they're showing, right? So even in our day-to-day -day lives, we have people that are in the service industry and they have to be empathetic, but they're not necessarily showing how they really feel. So we have to put this into the context, I think, of what's actually happening. Um, I'll just briefly touch on this because we were talking about behaviorism. This goes back to the Turing test, uh, which was from 1950. Anybody here familiar with the Turing test? Okay, so we all kind of um, know that the idea was back then conversing with uh, another, some sort of chatbot, and if the chatbot could be indistinguishable from a human typing back and forth, then you'd say, oh, this is intelligence because it can behave like a human. Not really um, questioning necessarily understanding or, or sentience. Um, but I just wanted to bring that up because maybe we'll talk about it later. And this is where I want to move into perception. And I want to maybe address some of the reasons why there's all this mistrust of AI. And I think it has to do a lot with the media. So let's go over some misconceptions. And uh, here we go. Here's something that came out recently. It was a, an article about um, the 156 experts from 14 countries. Um, that uh, wrote an open letter to the EU Parliament saying robots should not be persons. Robots are not persons, they should not have moral rights. Um, we shouldn't even think about having to change um, the hundreds of years of human rights um, laws to account for robots because that's not a thing. And it's interesting because despite 156 experts from 14 countries saying that this is not a thing, the headline is, Europe divided over robot person ethics. It's kind of like climate change experts um, debating with, you know, other, you know, like the, they're, they're making up something maybe that is um, perhaps sensationalist here, but I, I, there actually isn't very much um, 
to be debated here anymore, including Marie Dabo, who is the person at the EU Parliament who initially proposed this idea. She talked to some people over the last year. I also went to Brussels to speak to this issue. And she says, okay, maybe it's not a good idea to legally define a lot of personalities, but there definitely should we should talk about things. That's kind of what that, that quote says. <laughs> so just to show that there's a lot of um, a lot of hype around this idea of personhood that we're starting more and more to see that like in, in this kind of um, context, there's not there's nothing yet to be talking about here. It's not thought of. Have you seen this video? Boston Dynamics' newest robot learns to open doors. This is a very impressive video. Um, at first, I thought it was completely teleoperated, and then they republished a new um, video where someone was tugging on the robot and it still managed to go back to the door and open the door. Pretty impressive. But I still have a problem with this headline. What do you think is the word here that I have a problem with? Learns. Learns, yeah. The Brian Heater attributes the word very loaded word learning to this robot. So there was probably some machine learning um, involved in having the robot um, recognize a door handle, yes. But everything else was programmed through a control system, programmed by uh, an engineer. It didn't learn like humans do to open the door, but that's what this headline implies. It implies all this agency that robots do not have, and that's freaking people out. And I don't think that we should be freaking Maybe you've heard about this one as well. Facebook it shuts down robots after they invent their own language. First of all, I hate the use of robots for chatbots. They're two different things. <laughs> robots have bodies. Um, bots are a different thing, um, some sort of software, and chatbots chat with each other. But here we were talking about two chatbots that were going back and forth talking to each other. Eventually they started to make some gibberish, and people were saying, oh, they've invented their own language. And then they shut down the experience. How cruel and unusual. But as you know, somebody who would probably have tried this myself, I know that the real reason that they shut this down is because it just their chatbots just didn't work, right? They were trying to speak in English and there were some errors, and then all these errors accumulated to make some gibberish. And it's just like, oh, okay, our error, natural language processing was not really good. Okay, so and that was <laughs> that's the reason they shut it down, because it just didn't they didn't in that we're projecting a lot of um, intelligence and agency where there isn't any. So that's hashtag as well. <laughs> okay, here's another um, very popular... Nicole Scott here from Mobile Geeks. I am standing in front of Jack, the autonomous driving A7. So here we have Sophia Beth Hansen. I've actually met her a couple of times. One time she got a real sense camera so she could play rock, paper, scissors. Another time in a music festival in the desert in Nevada. Today we're going to find out what she thinks about Jack and the driving. So skip ahead. It takes a while to get used to the situation. It's a computer driving a human. Can you understand that? It's different for me. Because I know how reliable smart systems are. After all, that's what I know myself. I think you should be used to the situation of people being hesitant to your first. Yes, of course. I know that some people react skeptically to intelligent systems like me. But for my part, I have complete confidence in Jack. Look at me. Do I seem nervous? No, you're looking completely nervous. I'm afraid that Jack can engage in social communication with his surroundings. Now that's one of my special. Sophia never does media interviews without, do you see that engineer behind her? <laughs> With a laptop? <laughs> Why is he there? Because this is an illusion. This is Wizard of Oz. This is, uh, I know, I've been there before. Your robot's not going to work. There's no actual intelligence. You're, you have this pre-scripted um, back and forth, and somebody's there pressing the buttons. How terrible of, I mean, you know, judging them but like they're that's not that's not cool you're you're freaking people out and you're portraying deceiving the public that this very human-like um, Android has this intelligence that it doesn't right so I, I just need to make this clear um, because um, people can cut demos uh, and edit them as much as they want okay. 
And just going back to the, e the EPSRC principles of robotics, one of the um, principles was uh, transparency. So we should be transparent about the robots that we build. There shouldn't be deception. And so that was one of the things that I, I had a problem with here. But it's normal. Um, if, you've, if anybody's taken communications classes, you might know about the media equation by using NAS. We automatically project characteristics like humor, expertise, gender, um, attribute all these, uh, these human-like characteristics automatically. So for example, with this robot, we see it, this arm raised up over its eyes. We think, where is he looking? Is, did he find something he liked? Is he searching for someone? We just project all of this mental ability where uh, really there is most likely not <laughs> but um, despite this, this has been going on for a while. So back in the 1930s, apparently this was a thing, um, cinema started to, they used to have human players, okay? And then at some point, um, this thing called canned music, mechanical music, um, started coming about in these theaters. And ooh, poof went all of these human musicians. Um, and um, they, you know, people said, we want the real thing, we don't want to be replacing the humans. Um, and they even anthropomorphized the um, recorded music as a robot to make it seem really scary. Right? We've been using robots for a while to, to scare us. Um, but that's, that's really interesting because now, in 2018, the recorded music industry is a billion dollar industry with lots of people and jobs created because of this technological um, just a, a why are we why do we call things robots? It's funny because even if we have um, a machine that will do the exact same um, functional uh, uh, exact same function, somehow just giving it an anthropomorphic feature like an arm, suddenly we call it a robot. So that's interesting. Somehow appearance is really important to us, um, and I just want to we'll talk about this more probably later. Alice's talk, so I won't talk too much about it. But um, I want to get across that robot jobs are not necessarily the ones taking over the ones we think. Um, why is it that people um, get really scared about robots taking over jobs, but they're really happy about things like this? It's super convenient. You want to have um, machines at the airport that we can check in with so it'll go faster, right? We don't have to wait as long. But that's definitely maybe a reduced number of people that have to do that job. Um, Amazon, it's reducing the number of actual brick and mortar stores where people have to go and work. Those are closing down because of Amazon is giant. They're not, we're, when we talk about automation, we're not physically replacing a human with a robot. This could be software, Travelocity, where did all of those travel agent jobs go? Somehow we, if though, if um, a robot looks like them, we will feel threatened. But for some reason, not when it thinks like them or does some sort of function. So there's this thing in humans where our, um, if there's an anthropomorphic appearance that is similar to us, then that threatens our human distinctiveness, according to these psychologists. So lastly, um, I wanted to, so I lived in Japan for about six years, and I wanted to maybe give some hypotheses unfounded so far, but just my, what I think maybe where this idea of AI and robot apocalypse comes from. Some people think that it's okay that Shinto and Buddhist um, um, uh, religions think that um, robots can have souls because any object can have souls there, whereas here we think that um, souls are a very human thing, so there's um, some, some strange um, conflict there. One other possible narrative is just the idea of apocalypse actually exists in, in Christian and Western um, philosophies, whereas in Buddhism there is not so much this, this big apocalypse, uh, apocalyptic day. And so when I was in Japan, people would laugh at the idea, like, a robot apocalypse, come on, like, what, what are you talking about? Whereas it's just, this is where, whenever we talk about robots, like, oh, but is it Terminator? Da -da -da. So yeah, this is my last slide. Um, today, robots, at least the ones that interact with humans that I've been working with, they don't have agency. They're programmed by people with me, like me. I really think journalists should avoid 
things like robots can now, or AI can now, because it makes it think that, makes it seem like robots are, it's like saying humans can now run at 7.08 seconds um, at, for in, in a 100 meter, 100 meter dash. Um, you can't necessarily um, say that all robots in the world can suddenly have some superior um, uh, function just because one can. Um, and we have to also be careful to say robots were programmed to do something, and we don't necessarily should attribute um, learning to robots that don't actually learn. And so I'll finish with this this video, which you probably all seen. But I'm going to skip to the end. showing us because it might not be as advanced or um, uh, uh, worrisome as we need. It might be as... Okay, that's it. Okay. Uh, thank you for coming out here. I'm the, the least expert of uh, the people that decided in the, in the panel. Uh, and it's about not just robotics, but in general, AI and automation. Uh, so I start with some caveats. I decided to split up the caveats because I think the second ca this caveat is useful to remember at the end of the talk. And then I have some examples. What I thought was a good report that one of my colleagues sent me present to you the pessimistic and the optimistic view robotics and employment and finished with my personal opinion on what we should do that. So to carry about me, I am not a roboticist. I would know what to do with a robot if it stares me down. I am in artificial intelligence. I have been since my master's thesis in 1975, so I have a little bit of history of AI, uh, but I'm here kind of education of my David. And I have a bunch of great analysis colleagues. Um, I see Kostas there. Uh, he threatened to bring his entire lab, and I don't see where the rest of the lab is. I wasn't expecting them all. And uh, you can also tell that I'm not a great uh, top maker. I don't have any photographs of robots in my thing. Kostas would have brought his robot, put it down here, and it would have made motions, and it would have all felt like it was more real. Um, so, um, let me give you some examples. So, let's say the beginning, I love surfing the web, I love following up things. And so, this is what I came up with in the span of about three weeks of searching uh, of examples of effect of robots. Uh, uh, probably the most uh, fearsome uh, one is this Fox, Foxconn Chinese company which supplies Apple, Samsung, etc., which claims to have uh, essentially replaced 60,000 workers uh, with robots. Um, now, to put it in perspective, there are about 1.2 million workers in the industry, so it's not quite so bad. Uh, those of you who are students, uh, do not take my, my slide as an example of properly documented papers. I sort of throw in the person's name and probably the newspaper <laughs> or the year and the date, but uh, it, it should have footnotes and everything else. Um, second one is um, more pleasant to most of us, I think. And it's, it's, it's not as sensationalistic as other ones are, but it's more realistic in my mind, which is that Amazon employees 
can pick and pack three times as many products per hour with the help of robots. So it's not that the robots have replaced Amazon employees. In fact, Costas and his team participated in the Amazon challenge, and he can tell you all about how hard it is to replace people. Um, this one is interesting because of what it, uh, what, what, uh, why they did it. So Adidas essentially built a factory in Germany and trying to build them in other um, industrialized countries, which essentially, so the design of, of uh, shoes and running shoes is done like everything else these days on computers. And essentially, this system is able to go from design to production within a week because it don't, doesn't have to retool uh, assembly lines, it doesn't have to order the materials and everything else. It's using a whole lot of other stuff that's out there, including 3D printing and stuff which I have no idea what it means, computerized knitting, robotic <laughs> cutting, additive manufacturing, these are buzzwords. I don't know what they mean, but uh, what the contrast is, is that currently it takes them 18 months, as opposed to the week or two, to go from a design to a handmade shoe. And most sneakers are on sale for less than a year. So there is this agility that's needed in industry, which simply cannot so this is not replacement because it's cheaper, it's not replacement for other it's replacement because it's true competitive advantage to do things in a much shorter supply chain line. And so this I, 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 knew, I knew nothing about this thing and I thought this is truly you know, a, a new kind of robotics combination, it's automation, it's there, you know, I suspect there are no arms to see, no, no robot-like thing to see there, uh, but there are all of these computer programs, etc. things which produce. Two more things. Uh, this one was totally uh, uh, funny, I was coming back two weeks ago from Toronto, and the person sitting beside me um, was writing for, uh, was a newspaper uh, a journalist, and he wrote for uh, rail publications. And I, when I told him about what I'm interested, he said, you know that in Canada, they try this out. They have a uh, drone flying in front of the earth, the, the locomotive, Checking out that everything is properly, the, the, the lines are properly adjusted, that there's nothing on the track, so in, in fact it's increasing safety. Okay. Um, and there was only one person managing the train because the, what the drone was transmitting was being seen at sort of a control center somewhere way out the side of the, of the, of the country. Uh, one part that I found interesting in this thing is that the Canadian Union of Railway Employees blocked this thing. Okay? So there's going to be a lot more things that's that are going to be happening social wise in terms of robotics. Right? We can talk about what, what is feasible technically. And then there's going to be issues about the social reactions to what's feasible, etc. And to some extent, that's the part that that I want us to think about now, uh, because I feel that that leaving. I think you mentioned the, the global warming. Or you know, you mentioned how long it takes to take takes governments to sort of react to things. And as we'll see at the end, my fear is that. We are only going to start to do something about these things when it's a crisis and when it's too late. 
uh, I'll be glad people are going to be suffering. And, and so we'll see that my, my, my conclusion is going to be start thinking about this now um, and what we can do about it now. And of course, the final one, I don't have to say more than this. You know, the self driving cars are around. There are approximately two and a half million truck drivers in the United States alone. They belong to the Teamsters Union. There are about 230,000 taxi drivers in the United States. It's not that they are all going to be replaced, um, but if even, if even a, a tenth of them right, are, are, are replaced, can you imagine what kind of social things are going to happen? So, the pessimistic view, interestingly, goes back quite a bit. So John Maynard Keynes predicted widespread technological employment due to our discovery of means of economizing the use of labor, outrunning the pace at which we can find new uses for it. And that's a 1933 quote. Okay, so this, this issue of automation and, and replacement of job goes, goes uh, back a long time. Is there evidence? So, these two things are from one of the pessimistic articles by Moshe Vardy, who's a uh, professor at Rice University, with two, two charts. Uh, one of them is productivity in industry sectors, showing up the orange line, and real wages of good producing, good producing workers come down. Okay. So, that is a social problem. It seems that, yes, everything is going well for the, I'll, I'll now turn to be the, the socialist state communist. I was born in Romania and said, so, you know, there is the, there is the money only capitalists making a fortune, and there is the exploited workers uh, suffering uh, as a result of that. And from the same article, essentially, uh, this is the employment or participation in here, and this part is enlarged to make it look like more variation. And again, it shows that as, you know, it's been up to 67, and it's now down to between 62 and 62. However, labor participation is, is, is defined now. Again, I'm not a sociologist, I apologize. I know nothing about what this term means, etc. Uh, but this was this is probably one of the strongest uh, critiques by somebody who is knowledgeable in computer science. He may not be knowledgeable in robotics, but he's a superb theoretician. And he can marshal a good argument. And so this is probably the, this is, this is his conclusion, which is that the bottom line is that while automation is eliminating many jobs in the economy that were once done by people, there's no sign that the introduction of technologies in recent years is creating an equal number of well-paying jobs to compensate for those losses. So that's the pessimistic. Um, surprisingly, a more optimistic uh, view uh, comes from a McKinsey report. Benjamin, uh, uh, who is one of the other roboticists in our department, and I thank him for pointing um, to this report. It's, I have no idea how you can get hold of it. It's not published. One probably has to pay for it, but to get a copy, so I lucked out and got a copy. Um, quite frankly, I was very impressed by the way in which they went about studying the problem and the issues. It's much more nuanced because what they do is, rather than talking about jobs being eliminated, they take jobs and they divide it up into a variety of kinds of things that that job involves. And each of those categories is either more automatable or less automatable. And so they have a more nuanced view in terms of uh, 
not job being eliminated, but how much of the job can be taken over by? And it's more, much more of a collaborative view of robots and machines, okay? which I think is probably, you know, I wasn't, I, I, I had not thought about this you know, four months ago, but now I see that this may be much more the direction in which things are going to go, and it's more hopeful. So here's the chart from, from the report. So essentially, there are some activities which with current demonstrative technology, you can do it all automated. So sewing machine operators, graders and sorters of agricultural products, you can clearly see that it, when people are, are you know, trying to pick the big tomatoes from the small tomatoes, etc., you know, a robot can do that just as well, probably better. Okay? So, on the other hand, at the very bottom, it's hilarious that psychiatrists I understand, the legislators I don't understand, I could, I could see robots playing the role of legislators, <laughs> and we wouldn't know the difference. Um, that, Sort of an interesting flat point here, they say, which is that about 60% of the occupations have at least 30% of their activities which could be automated. Okay? So that sort of indicates sort of the balance of where you're going. As I said, I, uh, I consider this not wildly optimistic, but, but much more in line with what I would expect. In sort of Near future, how are we going to progress? Um, what uh, I'm not convinced with is repeated uh, statements of the following form. This magnitude of shifts in work activities over multiple decades is not unprecedented. In the United States, for example, the share of farm employees fell from 40% in 1900 to 2% in 2000 while the share of manufacturing employment fell from 25% in 1950 to less than 10%. Sorry, I'm not sure what the year was there, it got cut out. So this is a, my emphasis added to their paragraph. In both cases, newer activities and jobs were created that offset those that disappeared, although it was not possible to predict what those new activities and jobs would be while these shifts were occurring. So this is the, this is the optimism. Okay? The optimism is there will be new things uh, here and we can't predict them. And I'm not convinced about that aspect. I'm not convinced that, that we can just sit back and say, well, we've survived the Industrial Revolution, we've survived the uh, next one, we should just sit back and wait for this one to pass also. Okay? Uh, first of all, because it's very easy to forget that the uh, Industrial Revolution uh, came with real hardships. Uh, you know, when tractors came around, a lot of, you know, Farm workers were displaced. In fact, um, one of the other roboticists uh, wrote the Rapes of Wrath uh, as an example of poor people having to try to go because there was no more work for them to find. So, do we really need to go to that if <coughs> robotics or automation comes? I feel that we shouldn't. That's, that's part of my, the sentience part of me, uh, which, which feels empathy, says we got to do something about that before it comes to that. Okay. So here's a few attempts at uh, things that, uh, new jobs that could come around. Okay. One of them is obviously, well, you know, cars were created and then there was a whole industry of car repair, which wasn't there before. So there's going to be an industry of robot, like robot repairs. Um, because that's, you know, we talked a little bit about it, and he, he feels that there's at least 20 year gap between the ability to construct robots that do something and robots that have the sufficiently 
dexterity needed to repair other robots. Did I quote you more or less right on that? At least. How much? At least. <laughs> At least, yeah. right, yes. right, exactly. So, um, the bigger concern that I have is, uh, so, is uh, what happened with the invasion of smartphones? Where are all the smartphone repair shops? So the answer is, when something becomes a commodity, which is so inexpensive that you can just throw it away, literally, and, you know, the computer is still a couple of thousand dollars. There's no more industry to repair it. So, if, if, if the, if some, you know, the current robots are, of course, huge and they cost tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars, but what if robotics goes in a direction where they're building small robots, and because they make so many of them, the cost of making them is reduced to the point where they become commodity things. No need to repair them. You just say to get you to do to your iPad. Uh, you try to sell it to me on eBay because I, I you only use electronic equipment. But other than that, it's not so. However, something else. This was again a discussion that we were having with with Costas, and it, it caught my imagination because there's a link there. Below, I had seen this video. Uh, there was a a uh, little submarine guided by scientists on land, and it encountered the sperm whale way down in the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. And everybody was just excited and wow, etc. I'm not going to show you that, that video. But that made me think um, so here is the country, this country trying to employ people mining coal. Why not mine the seabed, which is huge, right? Incredible amount of material that is available there, which is now scarce up there, using robots, but guided by humans, right? Exactly because what can be automated uh, by this, the new learning techniques is things that you have 30,000 examples of repetitively. That, no problem. Okay? But when you're doing this kind of trying to mine on this, uh, under the sea, you won't have 30,000 examples of uh, having done that to learn from it. So you will need a human being. And so, again, my optimistic part says this is a direction in which robots and humans in collaboration could achieve interesting things. Um, while creating interesting new jobs. In particular, I would love to do that. At the moment, unfortunately, I think the only thing like this is pilots pilot, piloting into drones which bomb places, which is not exactly my favorite job. Uh, and the other one somebody will mention is that there is something like, oh, 350,000 one mini entrepreneurs. People who just do one, you know, sole enterprises. They sell things on Etsy, they sell things on various places, but to manufacture their stuff, they don't have a manufacturing capacity. And so this is where they contract out to digital manufacturers. So here's new jobs which weren't there before because person could never have afforded to build a factory to make that thing. But digital manufacturing allowed her. So, uh, before I finish, let me add a couple of things here, just because I, uh, it's a ca caveats about how good are we at predicting things. Uh, this one is a lovely one, 2004. Executing a left turn against oncoming traffic involves so many factors. It's hard to imagine discovering the set of rules that replicates a driver's behavior. And six years later, Google was doing it. Now, it's true. It didn't happen by discovering rules, okay, which is the, 
which was at the time the way people were doing things in AI. It happened in a very, very different way, which we hadn't thought of at the time. So, yes, this is why it's hard to predict the future, because we can't expect those things. Uh, the other one I wanted to, uh, I, I had found originally the following thing. Uh, this was a, an Oxford uh, thing which is available on the web called the Future Employment. It's based on uh, questionnaires. So part of the reason I found this is that as a member of SIGAR, which is the AI for uh, I got an email saying, would you like to take this questionnaire for that? And it turns out there are tons of questionnaires about it. And so that's how they got this information. And so essentially they took a bunch of 700 occupations and they asked various questions about it. And this is sort of the uh, uh, ranking of how computerizable they are. Although did the ranking the opposite order, so it's how uncomputerizable they are. And so you have to remember that. So the least computerizable is a recreational therapist with a probability of 0.0 to maybe compromised on that, right? And most uh, computerizable are telemarketers. Uh, now that's kind of puzzling because it is true that the phone calls from telemarketers are all automatic, but if I'm not smart enough to screen them, a person comes on afterwards. So yes, half of it was done, <laughs> but not the, the rest of it. And I looked for some other things which I thought were not quite right. So they felt that umpires and referees uh, can be eliminated. And I think that's an exa another example of social acceptance. Okay. We just feel that it's sports. Just, you know, we won't accept it. The replay, it's okay, right? But the sense that, 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 that you know, some kind of machine is going to replace human judgment is one of these social things that, that's going to stop things from happening that's happening. Uh, tax preparers. Again, uh, I have wasted the past two weeks trying to fill out my own tax form um, here, but there were constantly little doubts about, about how should I do this versus how should I do that. And people with, with much less confidence in computers and their knowledge of the world, immigrants, etc., are flocking to H&R Block and all of those places. So although they thought that you know, with 99% probability they can be replaced, again, I don't see the, you know, the, the acceptability of the replacement is not there. And I love this one. I have no idea why they thought that manicurists and pedicurists can be replaced by robot, by automated. In particular, because sadly, in our hometown in Highland Park, every time a shop closes, you know, the hardware store closes, uh, the European food market closes, restaurant closes. What opens instead is another <laughs> manicure <laughs> shop. <laughs> so there is some some kind of cognitive dissonance <laughs> in that prediction. So basically, I wanted to point that out in that uh, all the predictions that we're making are really uh, very tenuous. Okay, certainly the ones that I, I put out there. They're not, first of all, they're not my predictions. I presented what other people are saying. Um, but there, there, there's, there's uh, a lot to be said for it. So, um, my final thing is this, this is personal. So the first part of it, what can should we do about it? So there's really universal agreement that there's going to be a shift in employment. So just like there was a shift in employment in the Industrial Revolution and the Manufacturing Revolution, uh, there's going to be a shift in employment 
following this automation thing. Okay. So, for a few of you who are students here, probably you're okay uh, because uh, you are hopefully here to learn how to learn as opposed to believing that what you're doing now is you're learning your profession for the rest of your life. Uh, even 15 years ago, the uh, Federal Bureau of Labor was uh, prognosticating that people in your age group will change careers four times in your life. Not jobs, careers. Okay? So that means that what you've got to be good at is learning. <laughs> That's really the most important thing that you can do when you come to university, is figure out how to learn new things. A number of people are talking about the distribution of wealth to, to make up for the increasing disparity between the few companies which are making great profits from the automation, Amazon, etc., and their employees who are being paid less than everybody else. Okay. Uh, most of the talk is about some kind of minimum income scheme. Okay. Uh, well, I'm perfectly willing to believe that that's going to happen in Sweden and maybe even Canada. I'm a little less sure of that in uh, the wild, wild west happening. United States. Again, it will take a lot more convincing for that. So, there is, this is now more my personal opinion, but I managed to find at least one person who supports me in this thing. Uh, so, uh, this is an article by Kai Fu Li, who lives in China. He's a venture capitalist uh, who invests, including in artificial intelligence and everything. And this is his, his uh, uh, statement. The solution to the problem of mass employment, I suspect, will involve service jobs of love. It's a job that AI cannot do, that society needs, and that give people okay, So that's what's missing in the minimum wage thing. Okay, we're not, we're going to be, you know, the, the increased rate of suicide among white workers even though they have unemployment insurance, is because they're missing a sense of purpose in their life. You must provide this thing. And so, uh, the, so it says, the volunteer service jobs of today, in other words, may turn into the real jobs of the future. What I'd like to encourage you all is to think of more such things, and to do that now, rather than waiting Comes. So, I have no idea how much time it's actually somewhere I should say. Not to half an hour. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so now I guess we can uh, open up the discussion to uh, questions. Thank you. Alright, so guys, the floor is yours. I have a couple questions. Let me start, but um, let's see what we got up here. Well, I, I first want to ask you about learning because you're you're objecting to the statement that robots learn, but I I, I cannot describe in any other way how Sebastian Thrun's car which drove automatically across the desert figured out how to park like a race car driver. Except that it did it over, you know, there was a driver in it, and it parked, and it parked, and it parked, and it parked, and it parked many, 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 many times. And there was a program which did the learning, but it wasn't being programmed by a human. So, in fact, all of this quote deep learning can I please ask you to use convolutional learning as opposed to deep learning? Deep learning is such a fake name, just just intended to make it sound funny. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, that I believe is actual 
Yeah, and but, if it's if this is this especially this reinforcement type of learning where there's trial and error and the robot's doing these things. Typically in our bodies we don't do that because it's dangerous, right? We don't let a robot just wander around and do lots of random things and learn to learn how to do what it needs to do. And so many times when you look at robots, they haven't done learning in the way that we imagine humans to learn with the teacher. So, but yeah, in this case, if that's what they did, then yeah, like we can call that learning. But I think um, we attributed way more to that animal-looking robot than what it actually learned. So I think it's just. I, I don't know, but it, I have no idea did that. I guess it is too expensive to take that animal-looking robot and let it flop over and over and start all over again. <laughs> and that, that would be trial and error. It would take far too long for it to learn that way. So I'm, I'm sure you're right it is, about that. It is getting there. Like in simulation, there is way there are ways for a robot to learn in simulation, and then um, maybe do a, a bit of learning in, in real life. But this is not being deployed into real life situations yet. Definitely a research project still. So about Sorry, I just wanted to ask a question before I forget. <laughs> And I wanted to maybe make a, okay. just a quick note sure. about what you said about um, oh, the, the possible solutions to the automation crisis, if there is one. Um, one thing that, <laughs> yeah. that, I mean, I just came from France where I lived for several years and they went down to a 35 hour work week. <coughs> Wouldn't we all love if our jobs just allowed us to have more time for our lives outside? Um, that's another model that we could shift to. Maybe not reducing, not increasing unemployment, but decreasing the amount of work, work by everyone to rebalance. You know, our utopia might probably look more like that, like having a job with purpose, but just not doing it 60 hours a week. Yeah, I, I agree very much with that. In fact, I, I, I often ask people, so if you look back in the comics of the 1950s, how they imagine the future, right? And you see all of these flying cars, and you see beautiful semi-automated kitchen, right? You, you, you see everybody sharing in that, right? That's, that's what I meant. It's not, it's not that just a few people here have everything, and the rest of the people are slaving away in mines or, or standing in lines, et cetera. And that, that part of the vision is sort of Triple down, right? Nobody's talked about it and nobody's talking about it. So, so any questions? Sure. In the case of the companion slash medical robot that you're stated as one of your goals, what forms of privacy for the users of those kinds of robots are you currently building into these robots? Uh, I can speak exactly to that for the robots that worked in France, for example. Um, so especially in France, the laws were a lot stricter than they are in the U.S. Um, they have a, a very strict uh, consortium called CNIL, it's like uh, for information privacy legislation. So they, um, just like any other um, uh, information privacy, they, they don't allow, for instance, your personal um, picture to be sent to uh, a server without your consent. Um, definitely you don't have robots recording everything and sending your face somewhere. That's definitely not okay. Um, for the medical, I know medical data is particularly sensitive and I don't actually work on that right now. I think that would be interesting to work on, but I don't work on that. But that's even a more strict, um, there are more strict guidelines about medical data um, that should be observed. Um, I think um, it would be nice. So right now, a lot of our, our work is done on the cloud. So we end up sending this information to who knows where, what server where, and then that's stored somewhere. And one thing that we have as an ability to do with robots or with computers is to store that information locally. And so if we can have a little bit less cloud, you know, we actually we might be going away from this. We call this edge computing or computing on the edge, not necessarily doing all of our computation on a server and setting our information for, for it to be computed elsewhere. If we can have it all done on a robot, that means controlling your data. If we could build a robot that could do all of the computation it needed locally in its head, then we wouldn't be sending our data anywhere. And that means you would own and keep store the data on your local, local machine. So there's a couple 
options there, but we definitely have to have oversight and that's some of the kinds of laws that we need to adapt from regular privacy laws to um, robots that can actuate um, much more than our, our, our smartphones, where I, I'd say the laws are really lax right now. Oh, yeah, certainly. Yeah, that's um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a really difficult problem. How to how to uh, program self-driving cars? Um, you have to decide pro how to, whether to program the um, car to say swerve in a certain situation where that might cause the death of a driver rather than hitting a pedestrian. Um, very hard to hard to do that. But yeah, of course, all the responsibilities are in the hands of the program. It seems like from a philosophical perspective, it's almost not too far of a leap to say that if a program that you did or a decision that something that you did caused a, you know, some loss of life down the line because of avoiding something else, an obstacle. Or, so it just seems like I mean, you're not that far from a step away from the, whatever you did after you have the Yeah, I guess you did. You know, they're going to have to be lost in place to decide about how companies will be liable if they you program a car in a certain way. You know, you get certain um, yeah. results, even if the results are completely intended. There, there are some companies, um, AI auditing companies. There's one that I know of. It's an AI ethics um, auditing consulting company, and they go into these companies that are trying to build AI systems to make decisions to help and aid their workers to do something. And um, what they're trying to do is check the value systems or the value uh, perceived values of engineers as well as CEOs and checking to see if there are any holes. Is the person that is building the software, do they have the same value set as the person running the company? Because sometimes it can just be a mismatch, right? They're just missing communication. So there are actually pragmatic ways of getting around these issues if there's just good communication um, about this. How should we? Uh, how much should we be, uh, be afraid of companies uh, concentrating uh, power in, uh, and skills in the area of AI uh, versus not uh, being possible for smaller entities, you know, the universities, the individual small companies to compete into the artificial intelligence uh, field? That's a good question. Um, Especially now that data is so important in building AI companies, and a lot of the data is held by these companies that have this far reach, many countries, many machines, able to collect lots of data that can inform their algorithms. Um, so there is this, this conundrum. What we see, though, is that companies, they have business objectives. They, they, want to, they need to make money, um, and there's some sort of product or something that they're going to sell to make that money. And where universities, I think, can help is at least we're, we're still government agencies. We're still we still need to go for places where companies don't necessarily see market yet, whether it's healthcare or elderly care or people with disabilities or you know. But I, I think we still have a role to play to make companies that will target these issues because companies might not go there for until the market's established and through laws. So. I think we need economists here <laughs> because, because I have a different, you know, people are talking about, you know, in Europe, right, they're really much more aggressive in trying to break up the, the monopolies of, the, the perceived monopolies of Google and Facebook, essentially, by saying, look, 
because we can only do things through you. You have to allow it by other people. And the United States has gone through that as well with the telephone company, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but certainly at this moment, it does look very hard. And, and it looks even harder because, you know, it's a, you know well, like Amazon built this, this assistant robot for people by buying up a small company for $200 million, and that's it. They went to competition, they, were, you know, they now own it, they, uh, they've established their own research lab, you know, a lot of funding research at universities, so that's, you know, there, there, there goes something. So I, I agree with you that I'm, I'm uh, less than happy about the direction that that is going, but I have no idea what that situation is like. It would be nice, I think, if companies actually made mission statements or statements about their ethics or AI policies, because maybe then we could start to trust them if they clearly outline what they were going to do and what they were not, they would not do. Don't be concerned. It's actually really scary, especially, well, it's two, two different uh, types of companies, private companies as well as public companies. Public companies may be able to um, influence them through shareholders. That's a debatable thing. Um, private companies, however, um, the public has no insight at all into what they're doing, how they're doing it, what uh, standards or ethics they may or may not apply, what political agendas they may be pursuing. So it's, it's really a pretty scary time. I agree. I mean, with all the Facebook stuff coming to light, um, I, you would hope that it would push. I know that before it gets that bad, as you know, with Facebook having to be part of Congress and everything, would that push others to think harder about this? But I, I don't know. But it's um, one thing that's interesting is with robotics, we are very careful to deploy technologies that are that have a lot of oversight because we make things that are potentially dangerous to our physical selves. However, there are these companies that have a lot of influence and power over our mental states, and they are not um, constrained or put to the same rigorous testing as robotics. But it can have as much of an impact on us as these things um, can, robots can on our physical selves. So that's something maybe that, that has to change. Um, so automation has been like sort of a persistent kind of uh, feature in the economy, like pretty much since it's existed. You know, like people used to have to like you know sow their own fields and like you know they figure out how to get like horses or bulls to do it, right? And now they can go do other things. Or the loom comes out, and now you know sewing companies can make a lot of clothes for a lot of people, and all those people you know go do other things. So, do you feel like uh, intelligence sort of uh, Industrialization is like quantitative or qualitatively different than something like I don't know the loom, in terms of like replacing jobs and disrupting the economy. Um, I do because it's general purpose. So each one of the things that you're describing was sort of a special purpose kind of thing which affected it one way or another, whereas. Because we're using general purpose computers, we, we can much more quickly, right? <laughs> just, just as quickly as, as you know, Adidas is now changing shoes, uh, styles, there's nothing to stop us from some eventually building, getting to a point where we can be creating more and more different and different kinds of products. And it's, it, to me, that's the sense in which the speed that it's happening, it's coming at, that it's different, okay? and that because of that, something is different. But of course, that's the secret is gone. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, and that's where I think I find you to be such uh, an optimist in terms of uh, capabilities uh, uh, in the, and the technological advancements that are taking place. Uh, I think the people that are in robotics uh, and, and the automation know how hard it is to solve uh, to develop something like a universal worker. 
why there's going to be all this automation, which I find that it is business as usual in many ways at, mm -hmm. uh, at economic and, uh, economical level. What we're afraid of, really, the development of a, a universal worker that you can, uh, uh, you know, be able to really replace every um, walking biped that the, we have today is so far out, uh, and uh, this uh, would be uh, what really would change the speed of uh, replacing jobs. And also what we allow them to, to do. Um, uh, uh, we're, you're talking about the strike, the strike against the um, automated uh, trains. And, um, it wasn't the strike, they just simply they said no. no. They, they have a they problem, they, you know, they threatened the, the strike or whatever. Said, okay. they, the union said no, we're not going to agree to this. Yeah. The unions are stronger in Canada, so that's what this is going to happen. You were talking about the self-driving cars and 3.5 million. There are actually more males in the United States who are employed as truck drivers than in any other field. And those jobs are going to be gone in the not too distant future. Yep. So then we don't need a universal worker, we just need a self driving truck, and we'll have self driving trucks. And that, 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 you know, so I was careful to point out that I, I did not expect the universal person, right? I was ex what, I, what I was expecting is the ability to create very special, fast, very specialized things that do specialized kinds of stuff. Okay? Each one of them totally dumb, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worried about uh, the singularity, I'm not worried about intelligent robots taking over, that's not nowhere near on my horizon. It's, it's, the, it's the ability to change and create a manufacturing system which will now all of a sudden produce certain kinds of robots which can do very specific kinds of things that currently a human is doing. That's more what I would say. Yeah, we know we know how upset people were in coal country um, about the loss of jobs. We could see that at the last election. Um, but right now, some coal jobs are coming back, but not many, even though it's really almost like welfare subsidizing the coal mm -hmm. industry. Yeah. But even the coal miners today are working with machines that do the work of four coal miners. You know, it wouldn't take long at all to have a machine, you know, have machines that can dig coal 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it's 55 days a year. So you don't need any, any uh, workers, coal, coal miners at all. But it all comes down to the speed of replacement, right, and the speed of, with which the technology is being adopted. And I think we have been spoiled the last uh, decades from mm -hmm. the internet and the cell phone. Mm -hmm. um, while when it comes to manufacturing and the, the physical uh, processes, there is an extra uh, layer uh, of mm -hmm. complexity that you have to, to deal with, which slows down actually uh, the process and the costs are much higher. Uh, you're afraid that you know the robots are going to become so cheap, right, that we're going to be throwing them away the same way that perhaps we're replacing phones. Uh, but it's, it's a significant difference in scale currently. And uh, even with economies of scale, we're not going to get down to the point where uh, you know, a robotic device may be easily replaceable instead of being repaired. Uh, so there are, there are differences in technologies uh, which can affect the speed with which there's going to be this uh, replacement of jobs. And why, you know, there are 3.5 uh, male truckers uh, uh, today, um, there is going to be the capability in a few years of someone that is uh, perhaps a 50 year old uh, a woman or man uh, from their uh, living room, they're going to be able to have a job of controlling a truck that is many miles away and perhaps multiple such uh, trucks without ever really need to be there, making it a much uh, easier job that everyone can participate uh, in. It's going to be a much smaller part of the economy. And uh, other jobs will be created in this. Uh, oh, yeah, that's an, that's an optimistic <laughs> view. Uh, yeah. Um, so this is not addressing all of your points, but uh, just to give one more example to the audience, think of welding. They now have robots that can weld. And they pay for themselves within two years. So the welding profession is just going to go to robots. And yes, you know, the most successful story of robotics has been the automotive industry. And uh, Elon Musk, which uh, I don't think you can accuse him that he's not a, a technological optimist, yeah. uh, just uh, admitted that the reason that they have the 
uh, significant delays in uh, the production that they have, uh, they're aim aiming for is that they have introduced too much automation and they're just replace their conveyor belts with people. Yeah. So it's too mature. It's like it's like the Uber cars, which are self-driving. It's too mature technology. But if, even you know, I, I certainly agree with your scenario that not every big truck is going to be that uh, you know self-driving, and that's what you're going to what you're describing. That one person is going to be the convoy of four trucks from the metro. So their job will definitely be better and better paid. But that, that means that there will be three unemployed truck drivers. Mm -hmm. that, that three others who would have driven that other trucks in that small convoy. Now, now comes the optimism on your part that we'll find something to, for them to do. And I'm not saying that we won't, but I'm saying we need to start thinking now about what those things will be. Because if we wait, Till those things come around, then the Teamsters Union is going to say, no, we're not going to have such things. Right? And then things are going to be a little bit more complicated. So that's, I think that's. It, it might take a generation. I mean, one, there was one quote by a woman working in a factory, and they introduced a robot next to her. And uh, she said, well, so it's a robot, it does this job, but I don't want my son having to do the job that I do. And I so it might take a generation of people going out of work. Uh, oh. I don't know, that's one possibility. I, 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 I have no problem with people being uh, relieved of repetitive, bad job, right? But I think we should think now about what are the other kinds of things. In other words, the, that's what I didn't like about this end of that statement from McKinsey. Uh, we could never have imagined it. Now, we're pretty imaginative people. We have, you know, we have, we have. Uh, nobody tried to imagine what what was happening after the industrial revolution, but it's not clear that people could not have imagined some of those things and planned. So all I'm saying is, uh, there is enough brain power now on the earth that some some of it should be devoted to just thinking about what could we do. After. I gave a few examples of what came to my mind that I read about, but not, not, you know, um, what's the view, which is the Pollyanna, or yeah, Pollyanna's view of oh, something will come along. That's that's the part that I'm uncomfortable. Yeah, we do need to start thinking of planning now. You know, there's also, as you know, so much resistance in the U.S. to any kind of welfare state. You may be unemployment rate might just be such it just people have to just continually be on some kind of welfare. <laughs> if you think of places like uh, Saudi Arabia, right, when the, the teeny tiny percent of people are enormously wealthy. Other people in the country aren't. Well, how do they stay in power? Well, they stay in power in the following way. Everybody in Saudi Arabia has a house, a car, the kids go to a good school. They have, if they have a job, it's often just a make work job. But they really need to be, have anybody doing it, but they get paid for it anyway. And that works out fine, but you know, it's a kind of massive welfare state. Let's think of how much resistance there is in the US to, to welfare. And I think that's interesting, the last point about um, having the service jobs out of love um, become mm -hmm. the, the future jobs. Um, in Japan, living there, I saw um, people who are older, but they still wanted to work, and they're doing things like showing people uh -huh. where to enter into the parking garage. Like, you don't need that person there, but they're there to perform a service. Um, and there's a lot of these types of jobs. It's strange, though, because in general, the population of Japan works a lot anyway. But uh, So it's not like they're underworking to make these jobs. But um, that idea of contribution exists in other countries. Wasn't your robot doing that and that? Letting people into the... Into the <laughs> Star Wars, I thought that was your example. Okay, here's one example of one thing that they actually wanted the robot to do outside of Japan. Um, and I think I shared this earlier was uh, at the SNCF, which is like the training service of the Amtrak of, of, of France, which actually has a very strong union, so it would be like the last place you'd expect them to have a robot. They had said they had this problem. People working at the train station said, every day we answer the same questions over and over and over. And it's, 
where is the washroom? Where is the nearest McDonald's? Where is the city hall? And it's they're like, we're here to talk about trains. We don't want to talk about all these things. So can the robot answer these questions? And so a lot of these jobs, they come up with things that they would love to automate. And so if we put the automation towards those things, maybe we find jobs that are, are automatable and world that society is okay with. But we have to talk, it has to be a conversation, not just like the same position of but you know, she's going to put the robots in where they're going to make the most money. That's true. That's the manager is controlling the... Having, you know, robots, they call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah, but you, but you. Uh, Do we as up-and-coming computer scientists and engineers or robotists have uh, an ethical responsibility to resist uh, the use of, like, our technological fields for war. Um, like we saw uh, recently with Google, like uh, uh, a bunch of employees, you know, uh, signed an open letter about their collaboration with the Department of Defense. Uh, is it maybe time for some sort of collective action, maybe even a union in, in sort of more, more field? So among robotics, at least there's a lot of um, uh, there's a group of researchers that uh, are against the autonomous weapons. There's a ban on autonomous weapons that many of us have signed against. So that's there are certain things in, in that respect. Um, definitely for that use, we don't want autonomy, um, and that has to be that has to be put in place. Like the same. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I wasn't there, but you know, chemical weapons when that was banned, that's because we realized we need technology that shouldn't be. For a certain purpose. I forgot to mention another example of, of a technology which is right here and somehow socially it's not taking over. So checkout counters, checkout clerks at, at uh, supermarkets, right? 100% automatable. Every major supermarket I go in has a couple of machines on the side there, but most people are still going to the other ones. Right? So it's a, uh, well, the, the ones I've been to, right? Even I do that, right? Because at some point, so it, 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 I, mean, I understand why I'm doing it, because there's non uniformity. Right? So if every one of these machines worked the same way, if in all of them, when I had a bag of grapes, I had to do the same thing, then I would. But in different supermarkets, I have to do different things, and I don't remember. Right? And so I simply say, no, I'm not going to be bothered with this. I, you know, it's, this is not doesn't have a scan code. I'm going into the regular line. I want to joke with the person in any case. So there's this, there's other aspects to this thing which I agree with you will slow down the automation in places where it's perfectly possible. But uh, just because we're social beings, we might choose to continue that. Yeah, there are other sorts of uh, real social issues that are becoming up and we've been talking about. Like, um, think of a child, for example, has a robot, humanoid robot companion. Does whatever the child asks it to do that's capable of doing. How's that going to affect the child? How the child views people that it doesn't use a peer or a superior? I mean, you know, will it make kids grow up where they want to treat people they don't view that way as you know, their servants? Uh, you know, and think of having a humanoid robot in the house, which all of us may have at some point, even, even the older people here in the group. Um, you know, it's, it's wrong to do anything in front of the child. That demonstrates anger, right? But imagine, say, slapping a humanoid robot in the face in front of the child. <laughs> now, if I'm right about the robot, you haven't harmed the robot at all because the robot's devoid of sentience. But I think of how that would affect the child to see you slap the human. That's already true with Alexa, right? Just saying, Alexa, do this, Alexa, do that. Like, how are we teaching the children about how to treat? Um, Alexa should have a please, absolutely. <laughs> major, major design fault of Alexa is that it does not require a please and thank you. And it's funny, robots um, put into this public spaces often have this issue of abuse. Kids will come up to it, kick it, and pull on its arms. 
and um, uh, it's hard to know what to do. If the robot reacts to it, then they just might do it more. Mm -hmm. If they doesn't react, they will still keep doing it. One um, solution that they found for this was with a robot that was shaped like a turtle, and when kids started to abuse it, it would just go into its shell and just sit there quietly until they stopped, or just, and, and they would just stop doing it. Just kind of the no re re response type of thing. It's funny we had to come up with these solutions to handle yeah, I, um, I don't know what it is with the year 2050, but there are some uh, roboticists predicting that by 2050, the entire uh, red light district of Amsterdam will be robot processed. <laughs> and they point out there's some real advantages to this because they're no, nobody's being exploited. And that would be true if the robots will be, as I predict they will be, devoid of mentality. The robots won't be exploited, right? They don't really have any mentality. The normal locations. And they point out that it's, you know, help with disease because you can clean the robots out, you know, disease problem. But you have to think about how that affects us. How's that going to affect the people who are using the, robot, the uh, robot prostitutes? How's it going to, uh, how might it affect their interactions with actual people? Um, yeah. It was funny, I was at a human-robot interaction conference a couple of weeks ago, and uh, the maker of, um, I can't remember what the name of it was called, the Harvard making a harmony robot, so it was a sex robot. And he brought a, a busted one, so she was blinking, the, the robot was there, it was just her torso, so it was really creepy. Anyway, so, um, and he was saying that he still tries to abide by certain principles. When he makes these, for example, he said he would never make a copy of a real person without their explicit permission. Um, so they have to make their own, you know, for their business. But he says also, people ask him things like, well, why don't you make a a more overweight, middle-aged woman for uh, a robot. And he's like, well, I have to run a business, and I, s I make the ones that sell the best. So <laughs> very weird and interesting conversations for an industry that's moving really fast. Actually.